Thank you everyone for joining us for this webinar, Headroom of a Sound System, presented by Jan Ben Zeil. My name is Laura Lawrence and I'm the Global Marketing Director at Harman. So just a few things before we get started. Everyone on the call is muted to keep down noise levels during the webinar. However, there is a chat function where you can submit questions to the presenter and they'll try to answer as many questions as possible at the end. This webinar is being recorded and the link will be made available a few days after the presentation. We do have a number of other webinars taking place over the next few months for audio, lighting, video, and control, and we'd like to encourage you to take a look at the different webinars in our learning session workshop series that can be found on pro.harman.com, as well as visiting Harman Professional University to see our many on-demand and certification courses that are available to you for free. Jan is a South African sound engineer experienced in sound system setup, front of house mixing, and radio broadcast. Jan started teaching sound engineering in 2001, developing course content over the years based on extensive, continuous research and his own industry experience. And now I'm going to pass it over to you, Jan. Thanks very much, Laura, and thanks for the opportunity to present uh, the session on Headroom. So in this session, I would like to present Headroom as a link between a sound system and the audio. So we're going to look at the audio dynamic range and the sound system dynamic range and look at headroom as a link between those two. So the roadmap for tonight, we're going to have to investigate uh, this from a couple of angles in order to understand headroom fully. So we're going to look at the audio content and uh, the headroom requirements will be different for various genres. It's quite important to have a look at the VU meters and the integration time of the VU meters, because that's fairly critical in order to understand why we need to mix softer than what the meters are actually telling us. And then understand the sound system. And once we've looked at the audio, VU meters, and sound systems, I will introduce headroom as the link between the audio and the sound system. And part of getting optimum medium results, we need to look a little bit at the sound system setup and optimization. And here I'm only going to give a stepping stone in the right direction because we simply don't have enough time to go full on into that part of the uh, setup. And I'll conclude and have a section at the end for questions and answers. So why do we need Adrian? Now, well, most sound engineers agree that Adrian is important. There's no real dispute about that. It's all about the audio quality. We want to give our audience undistorted audio. It's the best audio we want to give. That's why we need Adrian. However, the moment we start talking about implementing it practically, things falling apart. And that's what the session is about. I want to show that Headroom is giving us a process, a way of matching audio dynamic range to sound system's dynamic range. So I'm going to refer a couple of times to this definition. This definition, I would like to say thanks to Academy of Sound Engineering that I can use this definition. It's a definition that started from the, the founder late Mr. George Hutton. And through the years, this definition has evolved up to what we've got today. And the definition I would like to propose here is headroom is the difference in decibel between the chosen nominal level of the audio content and the lowest clipping point in the system. And throughout the session, we will a couple of times go back to this definition and refer to it and look at the various aspects of this definition. So to fully understand it, we need to look at the audio side of things. So here I've got the WAV file from a DAW. This is a recording of a live concert we did for one of our broadcasters. It was a jazz show, a very dynamic show. So the quiet part, it was purely a soft piano and the loud part, full on jazz band with vocals. So you can see in the 16 minute clip, it's fairly dynamic. So if we take a look at the audio, we've got our softest part of the audio represented by the green line, our transients, the loudest parts of peaks of the audio, momentary peaks, represented by the red line, and then the nominal level, our average level 
represented by the yellow line. Now, if we look at this from a different angle, our audio will be presented uh, with this blue block. We've got the softest part of the audio and the transient peaks. And the difference between the softest part of the audio and the transient peaks is the dynamic range of the sound system. We also have our nominal level, and the difference between the nominal level and the transient peaks we call the test factor. So we're going to refer to these terms throughout the session in order to match the audio dynamic range to that of the sound system. The view meter is what we've got on the mixer to show us the actual levels. So, and we also refer to it as the mixer meter bit. So you're all familiar with these LEDs. These LEDs show us how loud we're mixing the show. But it's quite important to understand the, the nature of the view meters. They only give us an average audio level. And they've got an integration time of roughly about 300 milliseconds. That means what we see on the meter bridge, what we see on the LEDs here, is an average of the last 300 milliseconds. So the split second transients, those peaks, we're not going to see on the view meter. And that's quite important. So we need to understand that the transients can be 8 to 12 decibels above the meter reading. And that's where headroom comes in. We need to have reserve capacity on the system for these transients so that the transients can go through the sound system undistorted. We do not want a distortion. And it, we need to know that on the, on the meter bridge, these transients we're not going to see. If, if those of you that's familiar with the AWs and some mixers showing us a, a peak hold, you would be familiar with this concept. If we take a look at the sound system, the sound system has got a noise floor. Now that's the little bit of electronic noise from all the components combined. And we need to make sure that the softest part of the audio is going to be louder than the noise floor, otherwise it will be masked. The system also has got an upper limit, and we're going to refer to that as the clipping point. And the difference between the noise floor and the clipping point is the sound system dynamic range. So you'll notice we're referring to the sound system dynamic range and the audio dynamic range. And we need to somehow link the two, get them to, to fit in together. On the sound system, most equipment is also designed to operate at a nominal level, and that's what I've shown here as well. So typically on the mixer, that's when we reach our first yellow amber LED, that would be the nominal level on the mixer. So if we put the audio next to the sound system, we can see on the left hand side the audio with the transient peaks, the nominal or average level of the audio, and the softest part of the audio, and how that match the sound system. So ideally, the audio dynamic range will be smaller than that of the sound system. Then we have some options on how loud do we want to mix. If we're going to mix too loud, we're going to distort. We're going to have clipping. So our choice on how loud we're going to mix is quite important. We need to be careful not to go too loud and have distortion. But on the other end, if we're going to mix too soft, the softest part of the audio will be masked by the noise floor. Now, most of the time, the noise floor of sound equipment nowadays is not too much of a problem, but we still need to be aware of that and take that into consideration. The question then is, what will happen if the dynamic range of the audio is greater than that of the sound system? Then we have a problem. So, on the one end, we can have the softer parts of the audio masked or the louder parts of the audio being distorted. And we don't really want either of these. In worst case, it could even be a bit of both. And we need to do something about this. So we need to somehow deal with this problem. There's a few options. 
the one option is to write the audio levels. So we can literally mix, make the louder parts of the audio softer and the softer part louder. And for, for extreme cases like uh, classical music with a huge dynamic range, this is quite often necessary on sound systems, but especially on FM radio. So then it's a very careful, gradual uh, process of writing the level, so the audience don't really notice it, but it is sometimes necessary to fit the audio dynamic range within that of the sound system. Another approach would be to electronically reduce the audio dynamic range, and that's where we use a compressor and or a limiter. So this is also an option to reduce the audio dynamic range. But sometimes we need to focus elsewhere. We might need to fix the sound system. If it's a matter of a sound system that is simply not big enough, then there's the answer, get a bigger sound system. Sometimes we have the right system, we just have some errors in the setup. So then we need to fix that. So this might be placement of speakers, where we aim the speakers. There might be a faulty cable and there's no signal on one or two of the speaker boxes. So if we fix all of these things, the problem might be resolved. And then one part that I'm going to focus on in this session is improve the system dynamic range. And that's something we're going to look at a little bit later. So if we look at bedroom, we've got our audio, we've got the sound system, now we need to link the two. And the headroom is going to be the link for us. So headroom will be the link between the audio dynamic range and that of the sound system. So here we've got the audio to the left, the sound system to the right. So let's quickly look at the definition again. Headroom is the difference in decibel between the chosen nominal level of the audio content and the lowest clipping point in the system. So if we focus a little bit, it's the difference between the nominal level of the audio and the clipping point. It's between the audio and the system. That's our link. So if we look at our, our graph here, there's our headroom. Headroom being the link between the nominal level of the audio and the clipping point of the system. So there's our headroom, the link between the audio and the system. But remember, there's the word chosen. Headroom is the difference in decibel between the chosen nominal level. We choose how loud we're going to mix. Whenever we stand behind the mixing desk at a concert, it's our choice whether we're going to go too loud, too soft, or what the level we want to mix at. And that's a critical part of headroom, this choice. So if we look at our graph, if we choose our nominal level, like in this case, we've got a decent amount of headroom. However, if we choose to mix louder than what the system is capable of, we don't have headroom, and in this case, actually, quite a bit of clipping. So there's a lot of distortion happening, simply by our choice by mixing too loud. Now, the choice to mix too loud might be because the system is not uh, sufficient or there's other errors. However, it's still a choice how loud we mix. Alternatively, we can go a little bit softer, and in this case, there's en enough headroom plus extra. So we could even reduce the size of the sound system in this scenario, provided that the system is loud enough. So headroom, in the end, is a choice. We choose how loud we want to mix, and that will be giving us the total amount of headroom that we've got in the end. Up till now, the sound system was shown as a single unit, one device. But that is not the case. We've got multiple units in the system, hence the word system. So if we look at the system, and I'm going to keep it simple for, for this session, we've got a mixer, some DSP unit, this can be a loudspeaker management system, something like a DBX drive rack, 
It can be an active crossover, some graphic equalizers, compressors, limiters, some other units, and our amplifier. Fortunately, nowadays, a lot of this processing is built into the amplifiers, simplifying things quite a bit for us. But for the illustration, I will just keep it mixer, DSP, amplifier. Now, if we look again at the dynamic range of our system, we need to look at this and say the headroom, we need to look at the lowest clipping point in the system. So it's the same definition, I'm just placing the emphasis on the last few words, the lowest clipping point of the system. So what does that mean? We've got our mixer, our DSP unit, our amplifier. The noise floor, and you will see I've placed it slightly higher than the actual noise floor of the, the mixer, the highest noise floor on the system. And, and the difference is specifically because the, hidden, oh, the, the noise floor is the sum of all the noise in the system. Then we've got the clipping point. Now standing at the mixer, only looking at the mixer, it looks like we've got a decent system. But in reality, clipping point might be elsewhere. And that's why it's so important to look at the lowest clipping point in the system. We cannot just assume the system clipping point is when the mixer is clipping. Very often that is not the case. And it's also quite a tough act to explain to guest engineers if that's the case, the clipping point is at the second or first orange LED. But it's quite important to be aware of this. Otherwise, there's a lot of distortion that we don't want. Luckily, there's a fix. There's a way to fix this. And if the lowest clipping point is much lower, that means our nominal level needs to be reduced as well in order to have a bit of headroom so that the transients can go through without any distortion. So mixing a little bit softer, we still have headroom. But let's look at how we can improve the system dynamic range. So we've got our headroom and we need to fix that. Otherwise, in this case, the lowest clipping point, we've got reduced amount of headroom. So the system looking at the mixer, we think there's a lot of headroom, but in reality there's not. So the lowest clipping point is very important to keep into consideration. And our choice on how loud we mix still remains. If we choose to mix louder, no agent, serious amount of distortion. So we need to mix softer based on the lowest clipping point on the system in order not to have too much distortion or any distortion for that matter. So in order to fix this, we need to optimize the sound system. So the options that we look at, Ideally, we would like when the mixer is clipping, the next devices should clip at the same level and the same for the amplifier. If we can get all the devices to clip at the same time within the pound seat, we've got the best option available. So we still have our noise floor, the sum of all the noise in the system combined, and our clipping point, the lowest clipping point now will be the same clipping point for all devices and we've increased the dynamic range of the system. So this is part of our solution if the audio dynamic range is greater than that of the system. We've got the, the bigger dynamic range in the system and better sound quality. This is the tough part. How do we do that? How do we actually optimize the sound system? So as an example, I'm going to look at a Soundcraft VI-1000 and the Crown Macrotech 5000i amplifier. I'm going to leave out the DSP for this, just to keep it simple. So we've got the VI-1000, there's the meter bridge. Zero dB on the meter bridge is referenced to positive 4 dBU, and that is negative 18 dBFS in digital terms, since it's a digital desk.
but the analog output when we reach 0 dB on the meter bridge is 4 dBU, 1.23 volts. And then if we go to the maximum, 18 dB on the meter bridge, that will equate to 22 dBU and 0 dBFS. And it's quite important for us to look at these dBU values on, because the meter bridge is referenced to dBU, which is a voltage reference, and that's what we're going to use to, to find the clipping point on the amplifier. To know or find the clipping point on the amplifier, we need to look at the amplifier input sensitivity. The input sensitivity is the input level at which the amplifier will give maximum output power into the specified load impedance, and this is just before clipping. So at what input level can we uh, get maximum power without the distortion? On the specification sheet of the amplifiers, it's given as a voltage or as a decibel value, and the decibel value is referring to the amount of voltage gain from the input to the output of the amplifier. On some amplifiers, we have selectable options. So we can choose between two or three different input sensitivities. So there the manufacturers give us a way to match the amplifier clipping point to that of the rest of the system. So if we look at the Matertech 5000i amplifier, and this is copied from the spec sheet, there's a three position mode, so we have three different input sensitivities. And it's given as 1.4 volt. The second option is 32 decibel voltage gain, and the third option is 26 decibel voltage gain. So we've got 1.4 volt, 32 decibel voltage gain, 26 decibel voltage gain. And now the question is, how do we match this to the mixer? Because the meter bridge of the mixer is speaking a different language. And we need to do a bit of calculation between what's given here, two different languages on the amplifier and another language on the mixer. So the three options, 1.4 volt, second option, 32 decibel voltage gain from input to output, or 26 decibel voltage gain from input to output. So the big question, where on the meter bridge do we find this clipping point? Again, it's a different language. So there will be three different answers, one for the 1.4 volt, one for the 32 dB voltage gain, and the third answer for the 26 dB voltage gain. Now, in order to find this answer, we'll have to do a few calculations. We need to convert these three input sensitivity values to dBU, since dBU is the language we talk on the mixer. To convert 1.4 volt to dBU is a fairly straightforward calculation. So we use the formula dB voltage is 20 times the log of voltage 1 divided by voltage 2. Why the 20 log formula? It's because we're dealing with two voltages. But whenever we calculate the ratio, the decibel ratio between two voltages, we use the 20 log formula. If we do a calculation between two wattage or power uh, values, that ratio we will use the 10 log formula. So now we need to fill in some values. Now the question is where do we get these values from? So the 1.4 volt, that's from the specification sheet. So that's, that we got from the amplifier. The second value for our ratio, is the 0.775 volt, is the dBU, 0 dB reference. So 0 dBU is reference to 0.775 volt. So if we calculate the decibel ratio between 1.4 volt and 0 0.775 volt, the answer will be the dBU value for 1.4 volt. And if we know the dBU value for 1.4 volt, we can find that on the mixer meter bridge. Then we can do the calculation and the answer we get 
5.1 dBU. And note that in this case, I can use the U at the end because we used 0.775 volt, which is the reference for dBU. So to find 1.4 volt or 5.1 dB on the mixer meter bridge is now fairly simple. If we look at the meter bridge, 0 dB on the meter bridge is referenced to 4 dBU. So the moment we reach 0 dB on the meter bridge, the output is 4 dBU. So 5.1 dBU will be slightly above 0 dB on the meter bridge by 1.1 dB. So now we know the one input sensitivity. So if we choose 1.4 volt input sensitivity on the amplifier, then clipping point of the amplifier basically is when we reach 0 dB on the meter bridge. Not the ideal situation. Luckily, we have some options. We still have two other input sensitivities to look at. To calculate the amplifier voltage gain to dBU is a slightly more complex process with a couple of calculations involved. So the calculation steps, the following, we need to calculate the amplifier output voltage, which is based on the output power of the amplifier into the specified load impedance. Then when we've got the output voltage, we can calculate the input voltage for the two remaining input sensitivity specifications, which is 26 dB voltage gain and 32 dB voltage gain. So we have to calculate the output voltage and then use that answer to calculate the input sensitivity input voltage for 26 dB voltage gain setting or the 32 dB voltage gain setting. So, Let's go through these calculations. Let's have a look. To calculate the output voltage, we're going to use the formula V equals the square root of power multiplied by resistance. Now, yes, I probably should use Z, impedance instead of R, but I've decided to simplify things and not overcomplicate matters. Where do I get this formula? It's an inversion of V equals V squared over R. Power is the proportional, power is proportional to the square of the voltage and uh, power is equal to V squared voltage squared over resistance. So if we turn it around, get voltage alone, there's our formula. But now the question is, what value should we use? Where do we get these answers? Well, we need to get back to the manual. Look at the spec sheet of the amplifier to get some numbers. So if we look at the specification sheet of the amplifier, into an 8 ohm load per channel, we get 1,250 watt. So these are the two values we're going to use. 1,250 watt into an 8 ohm load. If we use these two values, we can get the output voltage. So let's do that. We've got a formula and we fill in the 1250 watt multiplied by 8 ohms. If we do the calculation of that, we get the answer 100 volt. Now these calculations are going a bit fast. Don't worry, we're recording the session and you will be able to look at this again afterwards. You can even pause and make some notes. So at the end of the session, we will give the link where you can find the recording to go over the calculations again. Now that we've got the output voltage, we can calculate the input voltage for the, based on the voltage gain. But we need to do the calculation twice. One for the 26 dB voltage gain setting, and again for the 32 dB voltage gain setting. And we're going to use this output voltage that we just calculated as 100 volt. So if we do these calculations, we're going to first do the 26 dB voltage gain calculation to get the input voltage. So we start with our formula, dB voltage is 20 times the log of voltage 1 divided by voltage 2. Again, the 20 log formula because we're dealing with voltages. So now we fill in the values. 
the 26 dB, that is the ratio between the two voltages. So that's coming from the spec sheet. That's the voltage gain. So that is the answer of the ratio between two voltages. Then the 100 volt, that is the output voltage that we've calculated. X is representing, it's a placeholder for the input voltage. So if we calculate the decibel ratio between the output voltage and the input voltage, we get the decibel difference, which is the voltage gain. So th this formula looks a little bit rough, but we can do that. So if we do the calculation, we divide by 20 on both sides to get the uh, log uh, of 100 over x, which is that, that equals to 26 divided by 20. Now we need to do the anti-log, so that would be 10 to the power of 26 over 20 equals 100 over x. To get x alone, x would be 100 divided by 10 to the power of 26 over 20. And if we do that on our calculators, we get the answer of 5 volt. Now again, these calculations, you can look at this again on the recording afterwards. I know this is going a bit fast, but luckily you will have the option to pause later on when you look at this again. Now we need to do the same calculation for the third input uh, sensitivity option that we've got on the amplifier, which is a 32 dB voltage gain. Now if you know something about decibel ratios, let me show you something interesting. From 26 dB to 32 dB is a 6 decibel difference. And knowing our decibel ratios for voltage, we know that the 6 decibel ratio is a 2 to 1 voltage ratio. Hold on to this thought. I'm going to come back to this one. So again, our 20 log formula, dB voltage is 20 log times the log of voltage 1 divided by voltage 2. Fill in the values. The 32 is the 32 dB voltage gain. That is the decibel ratio between the input voltage and output voltage. Again, we're going to use the 100 volt as the output voltage, and X is going to represent the input voltage. And we do the same calculation, divide by 20 on both sides, we get log alone. Do the anti-log, so 10 to the power of 2 over 20 equals 100 over X. Get X alone, X equals 100 divided by 10 to the power of 32 over 20. Type that into a decent calculator and we get the answer, 2.5 volt. This is the exact same calculation we did just now for the 26 dB voltage gain. So let's go back to the hint on decibel ratios. 26 dB voltage gain gave us the answer of 5 volt input sensitivity. The 32 dB voltage gain is giving us a 2.5 volt input sensitivity. There's our 2 to 1 ratio. So this is a nice way to know that we're on the right track with our calculations. Because what we know about decibels is correlating to what's happening here. If you want to know more about these calculations, on the prosoundweb.com, there's a fantastic article by Chuck McGregor. It's labeled A Practical Guide to Key Audio Calculations. So if you need to get more info on the decibel calculations, that's a fantastic resource. But also you can listen to this session on the recording afterwards and go through it much slower. So now we need to convert these three input sensitivity specifications to dBU. Remember, we're not there yet. So the 1.4 volt we've already calculated as 5.1 dBU. The 32 dB uh, voltage gain, we've only calculated as 2.5 volt. We still need to convert the 2.5 volt to a dBU value. And the same for the 26 dB voltage gain. The 5 volt answer we got, we still need to convert to dBU. Because we, we can't just read the voltage on the mixer meter bridge. We do need to look at 
the DBU values. But luckily, these are the easy calculations again. Back to our 20 log formula. If we want to calculate the 2.5 volt to dBU for the 32 dB voltage gain, we fill in the values, the 2.5 volt divided by 0 0.775 volt, and we get the answer 10.2 dBU. And that's a value we can find on the mixer meter bridge. We have to do the same with the 5 volt for the 26 dB voltage gain. So here, same calculation, same process. The 20 log formula, we fill in the values 5 volt divided by 0 0.775 volt. The 0 0.775 volt is our 0 dBU reference. So we get the dBU ratio between 5 volt and 0 0.775 volt. And to the calculation on the calculator, we get the answer 16.2 dBU. So let's compare these three answers that we just got. So the 1.4 volt is 5.1 dBU. The 32 dB voltage gain, which we calculated as 2.5 volt, is giving us 10.2 dBU. The 26 dB voltage gain 5 volt answer is giving us 16.2 dBU. Let me, let me show you something cool. We said from 26 to 32 dB is a 6 decibel difference. The 6 decibel difference related to a 2 to 1 voltage ratio. And guess what? In dBU, once again, 6 dB difference. It's no coincidence. The mathematics is actually working out like it should. So if we look at these on the mixer meter bridge, where do we find them? Now we can do the plot. So the first one, 5.1 dBU, the 1.4 volt input sensitivity setting is just above zero on the meter bridge. In the 10.2 dBU, the 32 dB voltage gain setting is just above six on the meter bridge. And the 16.2 dBU, the 26 dB Input sensitivity, voltage gain, is around 12 on the meter bridge. So if I need to choose, I know which one that would be. I will definitely go for the least sensitive setting on the amplifier. The higher up on the mixer meter bridge, the easier it is to work with the system. Visually working on the meter bridge, easier to work with guest engineers, explaining to them that's the clipping point. If I choose 1.4 volt and clipping point is around zero on the meter bridge, that's tough. It's also not the optimum gain structure on the system, and not having the optimum gain structure means no edit room. Choosing the 16.2 or the 26 dB voltage gain setting at least is improving our system to have a slightly better edit room scenario. So what have we done on our system? We've got our mixer, the DSP, the amplifier. By choosing the 26 dB voltage gain, we've increased the lowest clipping point on the system. We still have the noise floor, but now the clipping point is a little bit higher than what we started with, and we've got a better system dynamic range. Do we have the optimum system? Not yet. And unfortunately, with time constraints, I'm not going to push this further. However, a fantastic resource is the Handbook for Sound Engineers. There's one chapter in this book giving a complete step-by-step -step guide on how to optimize the system and taking it much further than just what I've done here. So there they explain how to optimize the level difference between the mixer and all the units between the mixer and amplifier and do the remaining level adjustment for the amplifier to get the maximum dynamic range out of the system. So now that we understand headroom and how it's the link between the audio and the system, the question is how much headroom do we need? If I rephrase this question, how much softer than the sound system's clipping point, and that will be the lowest clipping point in the system, that I mix a nominal level of the show? That's almost the same question. 
So the guidelines here, we need to look at the audio program. Different music genres, different requirements. If you look at loud music, rock concerts, somewhere between 10 and 15 decibels. And this is still achieved using a little bit of compression and limiters. If you look at uh, high fidelity, something like classical music, as high as 20, sometimes even 30 decibels, depending on the subgenre of classical music. So it's quite important to understand the dynamic range of the music. If I consider that uh, jazz show, of which I showed the waveform earlier, that there I need between 15 and 20 decibels of headroom for that show. We also have to consider environmental limits, uh, mostly maximum SPL. It's one thing to go louder and louder, but there are limits. If we get to the point of permanent hearing damage of everyone attending the show, we will soon be out of a job. So we have to keep that into consideration. So in cases like a stadium, in loud moments when someone has scored, or maybe in a factory for a paging system where, where there's loud machinery, we might even limit the headroom to six decibels. But in this case, extreme limiting and extreme amount of compression. It's going to sound bad, no question about that. But it's a function of getting the message across without permanent hearing damage. So as you can see, there can be quite a broad range of answers to how much headroom do we need. And it ultimately depends on the application. What's, what's the content that's going through the sound system? Headroom is a choice. This choice is based on the audio requirements. You choose how much headroom. You need to understand the music you're working with. You need to understand the requirements of the audio and make sure that the system is suitable for that audio requirements. We have to keep in mind the environmental factors. We cannot simply go louder and louder. There are limits. There's hearing damage. We need to be careful of that. And it requires some system knowledge. If you have a system tech that can help you sorting out this, fantastic. If you're the system tech, this is quite important to make sure that the mixing engineer has got a good time, at least a good chance of getting a decent audio to the audience. We need an appropriately sized system. Make sure the system is capable of what's needed. And then this choice is exercised when you stand at the mixer and mix. So when you start dialing in the levels, the gain controls, during the sound check, that's already when you're choosing the amount of headroom. If you choose to mix too loud, no headroom. You might have some distortion. So headroom is a choice. So headroom is the link between the nominal level of the audio and the lowest clipping point of the system. In order to have the best chance, we need to optimize the system in order to have sufficient amount of headroom. If you're not going to optimize the system, we're going to reduce the headroom and not get the results that we want. And that's in a nutshell my story for tonight. So Laura, we can open the floor for some questions. Wonderful. We do have some questions. Um, the first question is asking, the ballistics character of the view meter affects the, me the measurement of the peak, correct? Definitely. Now, I'm not too sure exactly what the, the ballistics are for the different mixers, and the manufacturers could maybe give us more information on that. But there is quite a lot of information on the net available on different types of level meters. And the ballistics is a very important part to, to keep into consideration. OK, this next question might be for you to answer, Raul. Um, it's asking if we have these ca calculations done on the spec sheets of the amplifiers to be used faster. We actually can provide them on an individual request basis. They're usually not included in the spec, the actual uh, calculation process, but we can provide them on a case-by-case -case basis, depending on the amp model and the speaker model configuration. OK, wonderful. Would you be the contact for that? Absolutely. OK, great. Um, another question is asking if you could tell everyone again what the book's name was that you recommended in the presentation. OK, the book is the Handbook 
for sound engineers. It's a fairly thick book. It's got multiple chapters written by a whole lot of different authors. And it was edited by Glenn Below. So if I just quickly go back, I can show you that the picture of the book. So this picture is already the fifth edition. So there's been a couple of editions. But th this book is covering everything from microphones to speakers to ears to acoustics. It's a phenomenal book covering a wide range of topics. Okay, next question is asking, um, assuming the compression happens in the mixer and there is an EQ between the amplifier and mixer, how could we control the headroom of the signal as the headroom will increase due, due to the equalization? Okay, that will be part of the calculation. If, the, if you're going to boost the level with the equalizer, you're reducing the headroom. So ultimately, if you can get the mixer, the equalizer and amplifier to clip at the same time, you're in the pound seat, then you've got the, the answer. And then having 15 or 10 dBs of headroom, there is enough capacity to do the, the necessary EQ changes. But if you get all systems to clip at the same time, then you've, you've got a system to work with. Okay, we have a request here for you to share the calculation link. Okay, now we can do that. I will also give you my email address. Uh, there you can see that on the screen. Jan at joyfulaudioengineering.co.za. So that's where you can ask me about the calculations, but also a step-by-step -step guide on calculations you can find on that ProSound Web article by Chuck McGregor. And you're welcome to email me as well, and then I can share some of this with you. Okay, we have another question. Um, if you're streaming in something like Facebook or YouTube, the lowest clipping point would be found by doing research of what parameters on behalf of the platform? Well, part of that is the moment we move into a computer system, we're working with digital audio and zero dBFS would be maximum. Uh, and as long as the signal stay digital between different platforms, zero dBFS will be the clipping point. Okay, the next question is asking, headroom live versus broadcast audio, would you suggest running a separate DAO mix with mastering plugins for broadcast live, or rather handle it with a more flexible, dynamic headroom as you would live? Well, firstly, I would deal with the broadcast mix completely separate than the live mix. I, I, I don't like using the live mix for the audience in the concert hall take that for the broadcast. So I would definitely split that to a separate mix. And then the headroom requirement will be based on the parameters of the broadcast medium. So the broadcasters, if it's TV they, and we use the, the R128 specification, the technically we've got a 23 dB headroom spec between what, what the average level is and the loudest peaks. But that will be based on, on the requirements from broadcasters, and they will all have different specifications. It's quite important to speak to a broadcaster and find out what they want and, and adhere to their requirements. Okay, we have quite a few questions about how to access the recording of this webinar. So if everyone goes to the chat box, I'm going to share a few different links with you right now. Um, the first link that you see is a link to our Harmon Professional University training. So that's where you can access any of the certifications or um, new course content. The second link that I sent you is the link to our playlist on YouTube, and that's where we put all of the recorded sessions. So the session that you're in right now, it, it usually takes about three days for us to get it out there. So if you check it early next week, it'll be in that playlist. And then the third link is to our events calendar, where we have the full calendar of upcoming webinars, so you can um, sign up for anything that's coming up in the future. All right. Um, we have another question. So a follow-up to that last question. Um, mm. The question was more focused on how to control the crest factor of a compressed signal through all the signal paths. My understanding is that any filtering will increase the crest factor of a compressed signal. Should we assume a higher headroom than just the required? Okay, well, the moment you, you start working with filters like equalizers, if you boost 
to increasing the, the case factor, make, making the difference between the average and the peaks bigger. If you use a compressor or limiter, you're reducing the crest factor. Especially like a limiter, it will make the transient peaks a little bit softer. So by, by using a limiter, you're reducing the crest factor of the audio. Okay, next question. Um, what considerations would you have for optimizing systems to take advantage of analog saturation from an analog mixing console? Well, I will still go through the same process, make sure that all the levels are properly aligned. And the end saturation in terms of if, if you use it just as an effect is an effect. If you if you like a guitarist using distortion and if a distortion effect or saturation effect we get now with plugins, that's a creative tool. But ultimately we do not want to just distort the, the analog mixer internally by accident. So we need to make sure that we don't turn up the gain control on the channel too high and by doing that distort the channel internally. So the, the gain structure throughout the mixer is also quite important to keep in mind. You don't want to distort the internally in the mixer, but, uh, but I'm not too sure in terms of the term saturation used here. So if it's just clipping to the gain control misuse, then uh, turn down the gain, get the gain structure right. So we, if you're talking about saturation like a tape saturation plug-in, different story, it's a creative effect. Okay, the next question is asking, if the system is too loud for the venue, which equipment should reduce the level and not destroy gain structure? I will just mix a little bit softer on the mixer. And and in this case, uh, we can even further reduce the input sensitivity on the amplifier, make it even less sensitive to still have a decent gain structure through the mixing system. And that will just increase the echo. All right, next question. Would you agree that negative EQing is better than boosting EQing methods? Well, different uh, applications have got different requirements. So in general, yes, I, I do like to, to do negative EQing, but when necessary, I will boost. I will use the tool that's necessary to get the job done, to get the, the result that we need. But keeping in mind, if I'm going to, let's say on, on a couple of channels, boost one kilohertz, 10 dBs on one channel, another 10 dBs on another channel, I am going to run out of headroom. So the cumulative effect of a lot of EQ boosting definitely will eat up the headroom. And that, that's a major consideration. That's why it's better to rather take away what you don't want than trying to boost what you need to hear. Okay, it looks like that's all that came in through the chat. Um, but as Jan mentioned, his contact information is up on the screen right now. So if you want to take that down, um, he's happy to take any individual questions from you. So thank you so much, Jan, for presenting. We really appreciate awesome. it. Everyone enjoyed it. And thank you all for attending. We appreciate your time and have a great rest of your week. Thanks a lot. Appreciate it.